Okay, super. So welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for being here for a second guest talk of 2022. So it's a lecture series that we started this year at 10 Academy and we're happy to bring you different topics. So today we have our guest speaker is Dr. Yabu Balafantai. He's the co-founder and scientific director at 10 Academy. So in this role, he leads the content learning approach selection of technologies, as well as our 10X system, which is our AI driven ed tech and job matching system. So Yabavel's background is in physics. He completed his PhD in the field from uh, the School of Advanced Studies or CISA in Italy, um, after which he did postdocs in Norway and, and Italy, both I believe in the field of cosmology before he took up uh, a research chair position in South Africa at the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences. So in addition to his work with 10 Academy, Yabavel is active in industry, government projects and leading data science projects in these domains. And he's been recognized, among others, by the World Economic Forum and the Next Einstein Forum for his work. Today's talk will focus on the emerging domain of Web3, a new area of work for us at 10 Academy. Um, so we encourage the session to be lively. Please, please feel free to raise your hand or to type your questions. And as already mentioned, the, section, the session will be recorded and posted online. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Yevabel. And thanks, everyone, for being here. Yeah, well, are you there? So while we sort out the connection issues, he had mentioned uh, his connection was not uh, doing super well. Maybe we can take, I'm going to just start a quick poll while we're waiting for his connection to improve. Um, how can I do a poll here? Uh, I'm really curious about what people's knowledge is around. Oh, it's not letting me do polls. Okay, so it'd be it'd be great to hear in the chat box what people's uh, current knowledge around Web three is. So is it uh, people? Has anyone ever developed anything which is around Web three? Is it a question of uh, it's just a ge general level of interest? So it'd be great to hear from everyone in the messaging box what's their current familiarity um, in the Web three domain. So while we're waiting for Yevabel's connection to improve, it'd be great to hear what people's current um, current expertise is. So for example, uh, Ken's already been developing smart contracts with Solidity. So you, <clears throat> then you can you can explain to us, Ken. Okay, well, you can explain to us the difference between proof of stake and proof of work at the barbershop. I am sorry. I think this is today has been a in this. We can we can hear you uh, fifty percent. Okay. Yeah. Um. Okay, just let me try. Do you want me to present your slides and you can you can speak? Yeah. Okay. Let me try just like trying to see if other people are in the same network and trying to, to ask them to leave to kind of at least for a while so that mm -hmm. I can have a stable internet. Just give me one minute. Sure. So while we're waiting for uh, the connection again. It'd be great to hear what other people have, what's their current level of Web3. And if people don't know, aren't familiar with, with Web3, that's good to know. Um, so Ken's already made some progress. Um, others, just type your answer in the chat box, please. If we were all in person, I would right now take bets if Web3 is going to fizzle and that's burn okay. or it'll actually be something useful. Whenever you're so ready, I'm just, I, I, 
Is now it, it's good. What about now? It's, yeah. it's better now. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. I think let, let's start with that. And um, yeah, hopefully uh, things will be. I think it's the question that you, Arun, you start that is exactly where I wanted to start. So in, in any way, that, that's good. Um, and exactly what I want is actually to know also what people, why people are here in, in a sense like, I think Web3 blockchain is not new. Um, it's kind of, I think, you know, sensational. It has been especially with Bitcoin, but I want to actually leave you with something that you have question. Like if you had certain question before, and I want to be able to at least highlight that or give you some way of thinking in such a way that you could uh, further understand. And a lot more of my, the focus uh, on this presentation is in particulars, like just a lot more of like from a coder perspective or from a data scientist perspective, you know, what you want to understand to be able to actually participate, not know, not trade, definitely. So, I mean, it's a very exciting and uh, you know, one of the projects that I am also involved, involves like kind of understanding the uh, stock market uh, or like the, the cryptocurrency market, but that's not the focus as well. The focus is a lot more, it's really trying to give like the technicalities without too much overwhelming you, but so that you can get interested and, and get your hands dirty in terms of like mining the data sets, as well as also if you want to write some uh, blockchain code um, becomes the starting place. So um, in a sense, like I would like to hear one or two, what you want to hear. I mean, you can just type it in the text. It's like, what, what are the kind of things that you don't understand or you wish someone kind of uh, would tell you uh, or, you know, anything around blockchain and Web3 that you would like you know, you had a question before or that something you didn't understand. So when I received two answers, you know, two texts, then I will start. Uh, until then I will just be present. And just everyone, we want to keep it interactive, so don't be shy. Great, so we have one, differences. The good thing is that I have one slide on that, so that's good. Good, okay, what's Web3? So then, great, just keep your uh, questions. I will just uh, refer them back uh, when I'm uh, talking about it. So, do you see, like, my slide? Yeah, we can see it. Great, okay. So, you know, I, I, I could have just phrased the title, also just blockchain, but I think I want to really uh, bring the attention, Web3 and blockchain a lot more. So even if most of the, the talk will be really about uh, the inner workings of the, you know, how the blockchain works, in particular the Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, are working. So, but uh, it is also the building blocks of Web3 together with other technologies. So I think that's exactly the question uh, that was asked. So if I am, because of my internet, if I'm interrupted, just uh, Arun, uh, let me know. Okay, so I think it, I like this way of, this kind of understanding the, this evolution of the web, right? So. Um, if you are familiar with, I think it's in, in every operating system, in particular in Linux, you always change uh, permissions in your file system, such that you can either, you know, can make it, you can make it read, or you can make it read and write, and you can make it read, write, execute. And I like just that from the perspective, you know, the way we, you know, we say like coding now is the same ability to 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 code is the same as like in the past ability to write, you know, to read and write a normal you know, hundred years ago. So it's kind of becoming not only a, it's not, it's becoming just the foundation of like the, the paradigm we are living in. So in that context, a lot of the wave one, uh, just you probably, most of you may not know, uh, but it is about really a lot more of static things and read uh, only, just you get information, you go to the URL and you get information. 
while in Web2, that's what's really currently we are in, you know, a lot more is, uh, of course, driven by you know, social networks and WordPress and YouTube and everything. So you, are, you can participate. That means you are also able to write uh, yourself and it's dynamic. It's, it's a much more dynamic uh, nature. And in Web3, on top of that, it's, you can also assume that in Web2, it's much more of the, there is, um, if you know how to code, you can execute some things because the way that I like to understand execute is that, you know, you are the browser, you are writing an input, a URL, and the browser goes there and then there is a function like, you know, the entire the server, you can call it, and that server takes that one and parses your input and then kind of notice exactly what you want. And then, uh, so that that way you can assume that you are executing uh, in some way. But there are other elements in Web3, which is kind of that I will come and highlight, but there's also an element that you can actually uh, do some contracts. Like, so these are kind of the smart contracts or by the hand symbol that is implied in this, um, in the part of the, you know, the image on the, on the right. So, and, and uh, very few things, if we want to highlight, there are many, uh, you, you know, Web3 is just not fully defined yet, right? So Web2, we're, we know it, but Web3 is kind of, an, you know, kind of, we are going into it. So there are, there are gonna be a lot of evolution around Web3 itself. And we don't know yet even, you know, what constitutes Web3, you know, where does it stop Web3 and Web4, you know, forget about that. But even that element is not well-defined. So, you know, you, you have to think of it Web3 as something like uh, aspiration that we, we, we want. And in that context, for example, there are a few key elements. One is, for example, in Web2, you know, uh, a lot more is now, you know, dominated, uh, the, the wave is dominated by some players like corporates and they can block you uh, if you don't respect a certain element that they don't like or if they change their, you know, their kind of permission or their, their policy or if you are imposed, you know, like some, some government mandates, you will be able, they will be able to block you. And on top of that, the economical or financial transactions are external to the web. That means it doesn't, you have to build on top of it. Uh, it is not intrinsic. While Web3, so that's where it's kind of the, the second point in particular is important, it is decentralized. That means no one in principle owns it. That, that in principle, it's, it's really roughly no one owns it. But, you know, again, um, if we leave a good, like, So, so it's kind of like, it's a, is my screen? Um, Sorry, could you share again? That was my mistake. Could okay. you share your screen again? Sorry. Okay. Uh, let me stop it. Ah, oh, it's okay. So do you see it now? Yeah, it's working now. It's very fun. Awesome. Okay, no worries. So, so the decentralization really makes it, you know, like if you have enough uh, space and uh, you know, if you are, if you are, if you want it, you you would be able to have a copy or it will be distributed, and therefore, in principle, no one uh, can block it because you can fork your own uh, internet if you want to. Thinking of blockchain terms. But most other important things are that it allows um, just the financial transactions that would happen will be intrinsic to it because it's, it's a token uh, space. So there will not be like, it's a, an intrinsic to it. So that is, that's gonna be really defining because suddenly I think the, you know, the magnitude, the way that I would understand it is that um, because it allows that, there is gonna be a lot of technology coming, trying to kind of create the space, the digital space uh, or the virtual space, much more or closer to our space. The same as like the social media redefined what it means society, you know, how informations are propagating. And this economical space being created in, in, a, in a virtual way will be basically, a, you know, kind of will create the way that we live in. So one is actually the metaverse, right? It's like, you know, everybody probably have heard even Facebook has changed the name into meta. And in there, even what is a digital space? What is a space? What is even a house? What is a, a capital? What, 
all of this that really, you know, kind of our life is built around is going to be redefined uh, in Web3. So it is the potential because we, we now have now a, a way like, you know, you go to the government to, to guarantee you something. Now you don't need that kind of guarantee. You, you actually will be able to uh, write a code and that code, you know, written and owned by everybody and kind of secured by, let's imagine that quantum, uh, evolu the kind of the quantum revolution will, will still kind of uh, not be able to disrupt this, this kind of the cryptographic uh, way of securing things. And hopefully there will be, you know, uh, quantum cryptography that will be even more secure in that space. But so for a uh, foreseeable future, that it will be secured by, you know, um, like the cryptographic technology. And what that really means is that, I think a uh, way to put it is that to build something becomes much cheaper than to destroy it. You know, that's what cryptography is. Like you, you would be able to just generate your private key and that would secure you a lot than any government, uh, but someone else to try to steal your money or to try to kind of hack you will have to do a lot more. And this is one of you know the very few technologies that allows that asymmetry, that building something is much easier than actually destroying it. So that kind of is you know my slide on on the the, pot, the promise of Web3 um, and you know what the technology is coming. Well, then I will just go straight into you know this what constitutes this this space. You know this space we have you know Web3 has been a lot more fueled by the blockchain, and I'm going to be a lot more about what constitutes the inner workings of it and from the programming perspective and from the data analysis perspective how you should understand it or what are the, the elements that one should understand okay so i will start with the very two uh, fundamentals that will be essential for my talk as well as also the kind of like the evolution of uh, blockchain one is ledgers you know they are basically it's it's just transactions, right? Like someone states something and, and, and then you kind of keep that record because this is the, the really fun, fundamental blocks of blockchain, especially when it comes, you know, Bitcoin, what, what you know, is nothing else. I mean, everything else around it is to secure this thing, but this record is your money. Like, you know, money is just the record itself. So it's, you know, you, you invent uh, from the, at the beginning something and then you reward for some mining, you know, for some work or something, but it's just that, like you convert that, that thing into, when you record it, it becomes money. So there's nothing else like from, from value perspective, it is just the ledger itself. And, and ledger, you know, from the normal, we know, you know, just if you keep up some bookkeeping uh, books or if you have seen, that's exactly what it is. And then another element is contracts. And contracts are, you know, the, the way to look at it is just that in a normal way, we always um, have to have a certain guarantee. Basically, you know, uh, if someone promises and if they don't do it, if there's no accountability, um, then, you know, it's going to be a really a messy world, right? So, and these contracts kind of you, uh, allows you to, for a government, you know, if you are written, writing it in a certain way and stuff like that, in a certain condition, then it will be allowed, and especially if the government bodies kind of affirm it, then this will be foreseeable. So legally enforceable agreement uh, more than just anything. So that part of contract is essential. But now when we, like the evolution of like, of course, blockchain is that not only the transactions that you, are, you have seen in, in just uh, previously in the ledger, there is nothing uh, blocking them from being, them being like some codes, right? and or being contracts that are executed in a certain you know virtual machine and as long as that contract you send that that transaction and that transaction probably a trigger for a certain agreement that everyone knows that unchangeable in, in, immutable so that means once you write it and then it will be it will happen uh, based on the, the kind of how you define it so it kind of becomes a new way of thinking of contract that the enforcer becomes the blockchain enforces it because the way it's written will, uh, will make it basically no one can change it. You know, you, the, because as long as you, know, you, you had put, for example, if you have a contract that says like somebody pays A, pays B, 
and if you know everything is already uh, controlled by the code it will happen uh, based on the specifications based on basically what is specified in there so that is what a smart contract is uh, or what's different from it no enforcer no lawyer it's cheap and you write and basically uh, it's it's a you know kind of a, a code that or a contract is owned by or is um, uh, seen and visible by the public and therefore it cannot be changed back right so you, like the kind of acts as is really the enforcer itself the public and the blockchain together um, or the distribution, the distributed nature of it will make it enforceable uh, in a different way. Of course, it's not legal. There are other developments now. It's called smart legal contracts, but you know this is something. And I want to pause here, and then I want to actually ask people, like, how this thing in in the in the sense of Africa, there is uh, you know uh, a lot of uh, contracts happen verbally. And a lot of them are kind of the society actually enforces them. You know, it's like if someone owns somebody and it usually happens that the, the other person pays, even if there is no legality. And this is uh, much more kind of very closer, I think, for people to understand actually smart contracts in a blockchain sense is much more uh, understandable. I, I mean, at least for me, I like to understand them from very many contract types that are done um, when I grew up like in a community. So I want you, you know, I'm kind of challenging you to start relating what contracts do you know that are enforceable by its distributed nature um, in your community. Okay, so that basically just, you know, I'm gonna be rushing and just, this is just the entry. So um, in a normal contract, it's kind of like, or in a normal transaction, there has to be somebody that if some two people disagree, uh, that someone sends money to another one and if the other one says no I didn't receive or like something happens and or um, the other the sender for example just wants to cheat and said I sent there, there has to be somebody that is safeguarding these entries and that's usually like in terms of finance or bank it's the bank uh, an authority um, and this is what blockchain is kind of replacing to to not have such uh, authority right so there are just very quickly, there are the different types of networks, and these networks is, is really nice to understand from multiple perspectives, from you know distributed computing, uh, distributed kind of like uh, data management, you know, like all of that. Uh, but in the kind of in the sense of like this blockchain, what you should understand is that the blockchain is a decentralized ledger or a distributed one. Um, I think there are many, many differences between the two, so it's just a, a lot more. There are different types of blockchains. They could be decentralized or they could be distributed, but a lot more of that that you know is the distributed one. That means everybody has a copy of everybody else. So it just, that means like, you know, um, the distributed nature is uh, what you see in the right side. While the bank is, you know, the clients around and the bank becomes just a central agency. So it's a centralized manner. Even in blockchains, even if they, they are not called blockchains, like some of them, some of the evolutions can be centralized. And there is also a permission and permissionless. That means like, do you have, can you enter into this network with permission or without permission? And, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum and whatever others that you know, they are permissionless. Some other blockchains, they can be permission. So even on top of that, on top of the distributedness, there is also another layer for permission and, and, and permission. And public blockchain, when we say public blockchain, that means like you can join um, and uh, you don't need any permission. Okay. Okay. So what are the challenges? I mean, why didn't it happen before? You know, it's like kind of, because we know a lot of, there are many distributed systems, right? But the main important thing you want to understand is called this consensus. How do you make distributed systems to, to have, to agree, right? So in particular, in particular, um, where I am kind of like going to be focusing is that, so you want to have, um, you know, you have distributed systems and you want to elect or you want to make some decision. And that decision is uh, kind of, it could be like elect a leader, like, you know? So when, we, when they are machines, it's kind of, it's probably easier because, you know, um, you, you write it and it's probably because you define it, then it's much easier to actually implement it. 
But what about when you have like machine and, uh, and hybrid system, machines and humans, where there is a lot of interest for actually cheating because you, know, you make a uh, gain on that. So that's called the hostile environment. That means people actually are interested or systems in the, in the dis in this distribution are actually interested to cheat. So in all the others that we know that we distributed, for example, you know, Kafka's or MongoDBs that are kind of replicas of the same source, um, you, you manage them and they, you assume none of them in their own intrinsic manner want to cheat. So it's just only the things that you want to deal or you will deal with is the shutdowns, like, okay, you know, a machine failure. So whenever we say like consensus in that manner, it's a weaker consensus. That means like when something doesn't work, when, when you say, and, and, you know, the network is kind of uh, out or when, you know, some, some technical faults happen or like that. So you want to still make consensus. That's already hard. But here, what we are talking, what blockchain answer is like already even the systems that are in the, in the, in the, in the network actually are interested intrinsically to cheat and so because they, they make gain because of that. And that is what really is um, the hardest uh, management and that's what blockchain addresses. And all of the machineries that blockchain provides us is to actually address uh, this consensus problem in a hostile environment. So you can also ask any question at any time so that I don't, you know, like Arun can tell me like uh, when, when to see that question and answer. So yeah, but I, have, I have a question for you. Just on the previous yeah. slide, you said you talked about a hostile environment. Um, yeah. Is is the Web two environment a hostile environment? I mean, it is not in a sense for your own systems. Like, for example, I mean, like depending on how you see it, right? It's kind of like, of course, people want to hack you, right? Uh, but you you can exclude them, and you will be fine, right? It's just because you control uh, your servers. It's like, and you know what you are writing in your servers. And maybe just for Facebook type, like where people are writing in it and, you know, content moderation, that could be considered, of course, like this, you know, fake, fake news, whatever. Could be, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just on top of my head. You could think of it like that network, the social media network, a lot more hostile environment and content moderation and, and all that is exactly you know, what would be here uh, in, in the internet sense. That one is still Facebook manages it. Facebook says like, you know, you can go out, you can like that. It can still moderate it. So in that sense, still everything is owned. You, know, you will be blocked and all that. Um, every data is, you know, kind of uh, included. Therefore, you know, Facebook controls it. So it can manage it in that way. But this one is actually, no one has, like it's that plus uh, it's the whole internet, not just owned by by one company who can go offline if they want to, and still the internet lives, right? But in this network, the hostile environment is everything, you know, just the, the Facebook, the Googles, the blah, blah, the entire thing. So with that difference, I would say, yeah, the hostile environment in the social media could represent closing. Okay, thank you. Okay, so what are, so I, I, I mentioned uh, really, I uh, think the very, very, very heart of uh, why blockchain works is because of cryptography. And some of us probably would know what it is. And I'm gonna show you also very simple, but like anyone who wants to use uh, to SSH to an, an, a different server, and if, they, if you had to create, you know, uh, private keys or some kind of way of authentication, SSH, then you probably have done it. It's just, it's the same thing. And you generate some, some key that you call it private. That means this is the base of everything. Um, and it, it, you can give it any number you want. And, and then it just generates long strings of numbers uh, or hexadecimals. And then that will be used with some mathematics that is exactly what is the cryptography uh, kind of uh, technology wasn't developed uh, you know, last 10 years. It was developed longer, like you know, since um, the 60s. This has been, and, and before probably also the mathematical components of it, but this elliptical kind of multiplication or some mathematical terminology ensures that 
if you give a certain key, then it will generate public key and you cannot go back. So it is safe then afterwards, like this public key, you can use it and you can actually uh, always together with something um, compute. And as long as you share the public key and the content together that you shared with, one can verify it was designed, you know, it was you, like the owner of the private key who actually sent it, right? So that I'll come to that in terms of demonstration, but in terms of the blockchain and kind of account number, what happens is that it's a very simple, yes, private key and public key, and your private key from is basically you, your bank address, you know, or whatever, which describes who you are, like uh, whoever is the account holder in the blog, in the Bitcoin sense, that's basically, if someone takes your private key, then they own everything you have, just that simple. And then from that on, of course, there are some uh, iterations to get to certain, you know, to save space, bits uh, in the computing manner, blah, blah, but then you get a Bitcoin at least. But all of that after that is just, uh, you know, a hash of a hash of a hash. So it's kind of like, but the most important part is the private key. So, the, you know, so for, I'm, I'm not going to read it. I'm going to, we're going to share it. So you will be able to see some of the writings. And I think the writings in the left are good if you are going through it alone. Um, so I, there is this really um, by Anderson, uh, by Andres uh, Brown words, very beautiful, simple visual uh, understanding of what blockchain is. And I'm going to start from, You know, just simple, like what, how you generate, you know, when you type, like I'm just gonna, if I type just even, so any number, one, you know, I'm gonna get a, um, a public key. Even if I don't write anything, I'm gonna get a public key. A public key that, it, like the private key that I enter defines, it's always kind of like uh, exact. That means for the empty one, for the certain algorithm that is used, it will be identical number. So if I type one, you know, you see, um, you see that if I type, for example, two, it's the digits are changing. But if I go back to one, it will be identical to the previous one that I typed. So I can type, you know, a lot of numbers so that people don't guess. I mean, I'm just gonna, I'm really bad at typing, but the usual way is that you generate a very strong, like, you know, such that, you know, people don't guess about your keyboard, how you type it, all that. Um, but you you generate some longer number like that. That's your you have to safeguard this because this is all you have to claim. You know, if you if you buy, for example, a Bitcoin um, with a million dollar and with a with this with your own address, like you know, you, you deposit it in your own address, and that own address is associated to a private key. Whoever steals your private key basically just owns that money, so they can send it to anybody. That's your thing. So this is kind of like the keys and then signatures. So in, in a blockchain, you have to um, actually like, you will use this private key to do anything. So to write any message, right? So, and that message has to be, uh, you know, whatever you, you could say, like, I mean, I'm just going to really follow. I mean, I have attached this, um, this link to the, another video that actually demonstrates this very carefully and nicely. So if you don't understand, you know, I would advise you to just go to that, uh, to the link in the, in my slide that you will be able to see step by step um, what I'm describing in a very, in an ordered manner that's kind of actually really described well. But if I say like, you know, um, I have a valve sent uh, about 10 uh, USD, this basically with my private key, I can sign that. And this will be the signature. And then someone else, so this would be like, you know, I signed this data together with my private key. And then I basically generate, I get this number, right? So I get this string, like some random uh, um, signature. And then anyone else who, you know, my public key is my public key. That means it's out there that I would announce it to the world and everybody has it. Now they would know that together with this, and together the signature and with the data, so the data that is already, that I attach it and the public key that I already shared to the world and the signature that I'm associating together with my data that I sent, they know that this was signed by me, by the private key 
who generates this public key. So that's the whole point of it. So if you don't understand it, again, uh, you can ask me, but the whole point is that you start with private key and public key, you share the public key to the wallet, and then whenever you write something, a transaction, you sign that transaction, that means the transaction in this case is just a data like that, um, and then you, you kind of sign it, and the, the signature, the public key, and the data, with that anyone knows that this signature can only be produced by the person who generated this public key. So that means it's a, you know, that's why it's kind of, when you say verify, that you get just this like green, that's exactly the case. You know? So that's what the cryptography is. So hopefully that gives you, and these are, you know, the two codes, uh, not only the codes, there's also the website, the videos that explains this. Um, so you can follow on these two um, links. Okay, and then what is a blockchain? So a blockchain, just to really describe it, so a user initiate transaction using their digital signature that I just showed you. And that digital signature, uh, the first transaction, it could be like the owner, like, you know, uh, the very first person who created that blockchain can ingest some amount of money if they want to. But then the next time in you know, blockchain and, and, and Bitcoin rewards for mining something, even an empty block, you would generate some coin or some, some kind of value. And then the more and more you, you kind of like then, uh, so the, the, the money comes in, as I said earlier, much more of the transaction itself is the money. The transaction defines you know, what the money is like, whatever is associated there. And if it is valid, then it's the money itself. So a user instantiates transaction, uses a digital signature, and then they broadcast that, that transaction into nodes, like into the, uh, the network. And one or more nodes begin validating each transaction um, and then nodes aggregate validated. So the validation step is very different from block making, but then now they aggregate validated ones and put them into a block and they apply a certain work like that I will come to, but, and then they seal like kind of as a block. And when the consensus is used, then the block is kind of uh, attached to the former blocks and it continues in you know, new transactions. Where do they get this, these transactions? People just send, as in the left, as you could see, people just like, when I want to send some money to somebody, I will just basically within, within the network, I will send those. And they just, they feel that the cloud, as you can see, are just unconfirmed, unordered transactions. And there's no order, you know, people kind of like the, the network or the nodes are kind of collecting. They just randomly. And that's why there is sometimes incentive. You can give some, some kind of a reward for whoever, you know, uh, confirms my my transaction I will give a certain amount then other people would be or the node validators or the miners would would be incentivized actually to 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 take yours uh, with priority but it's not a necessary condition so but that's like in the Bitcoin sense most um, uh, miners actually are interested to get the reward for mining you know but in another like in, in ethereum sense it's different people actually you you have to put a transaction cost that means like when someone validates your uh, transaction and puts it in a block uh, you have to pay so for that one in an in in ethereum sense you actually it's different that you know the incentives are much more of the reward but then blocks then are formed so again i'm gonna back i'm gonna go um to just demonstrate again with the similar visual way and in this sense like i'm just gonna show exactly from um the page that Anderson, uh, Andres Brown words page that I, I shared as well also in my slide. So basically a hash is whatever data as I earlier said, and then you get a hash, right? A block is basically a component. It has a block number. It has a certain um, factor that makes this block, um, in this case, an empty block. And an empty block is mined. That's why it's green. You can see the color in the background. It's green means it's blocked. That means in this case, the very first digits in the hash are four. That's kind of the work. The work that's asked is that whoever gets the data and the nuance, and then find a hash that whose first four digits starts with zero, that person or that nuance that you are searching for basically is your your proof 
that you did work. That means you spent some computational power. So if I uh, if I kind of like now add um, 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 so if I just have another kind of uh, data now, now this is not mine. As you can see, the first four digits in this case, it's a very spe specified to make it fast, but in actual Bitcoin, the proof may be 31 digits that you have to find zeros. That really is like, you know, in, in really, really expensive. And so this one, as you can see, it's red. Right now, the data is changed. It's not mined. But to mine it, basically, the computer or whoever needs to search the number, this some number, the nuance has to change such that the nuance plus this one, when they are hashed, the very four, the first digits, the four digits in this case are zero, right? So if you, if I want, if I change even a single, like instead of 10, if I want to make 11, I have to mine it again, right? So that is a block. And a blockchain is of course a series of blocks, right? So in this case, each of them have empty, um, you know, each of these blocks are empty, they are all mined. But if I now like want to change anything uh, in, anything inside like one of the blocks, like I, I can start it just from the, the, the last block. If I change, if I add any data, so think of this data being like the actually you want to add, you know, you want to send some money to your account or to a friend's account, right? But it is, you don't have it or for, for some reason, like before, after validation, you want to change it. And then of course, it's basically, you know, somebody has to mine. Let's imagine you have a computational power to mine because before this was the number that makes it zero, zero together, you know, the previous one was like, so it's always, uh, I didn't describe it, but because it's a chain that every, the previous field contains the output, the hash of the, the previous chain. So that means as you can see, zero, zero, uh, four zeros AE and four zeros AE. And then the previous of this one is of course this one, like the output of this one. So that, that they are connected, everybody, every uh, block takes the last uh, previous blocks hash um, to um, to kind of like connect. Uh, so that's what's called blockchain. So now it's only this I, I can I can mine. That's fine, and I will get you know some number I was searching. So after the after trying ninety five thousand uh, times, like changing the digits, I got one that makes it you know this this hash zero zero. Great, I mine. But what about if I want to change in the past? You know, here, I want to add one. So that means because I am adding here, all the blocks in front of it, because all the blocks contain, because this block contains the hash of the previous one. This block contains the hash of the previous one. Because of this connectedness, when you change one in, you know, in a block that is deep, you basically change the entire thing. And you have to mine each of them separately. And that's, as you can imagine, the computational power for that is really huge. And you have to have 50, more than 51% of actual computational power, even to change, to kind of, you know, game this thing. But if you are now changing even in the past, uh, changing all the serious things, this is gonna be like really, really complicated. That's why the security is built in. Um, and what is distributed? Distributed is basically, this is one block, but now this is peer A and this is peer B you know, peer C and like that, because these are basically just different people owning the same thing. As you can see here, they all have exact copy. If you look at the hash, they all have exact copies and that should be the case. And it is, you know, it's like everybody that is in the network owns the, the entire copy of the blockchain. And of course, right now we didn't write the, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the field, in the data field, it was empty. But it's exactly the same if you want to now to make money, like transactions in this case would be like, you know, X number was sent from uh, this to that. And again, I will, I will come to the next one, which is actually, this is name, you know, you know, you can write anything like that, but to not write like that, that's called the, the point base. That means it's, um, uh, no, okay, I'll, I'll come to that. Actually, it's here. Um, so, in the, in, the, in the actual blockchain, what you have is the from field and the to field are actually your blockchain address, right? 
So you can start with money, and uh, this is the outputs from the previous one. I will come to that as well. I mean, um, you can ask um, or you can follow the slide. I think the time is, I'm conscious of the time. But basically, you fill this, this component with like that and your signature. And, and basically, if I want to change anything 11 here, then the entire blockchain is kind of exactly as I said earlier. The only difference between what I showed in here is that here is a proper transaction uh, using actually uh, blockchain addresses instead of names and also the signature to sign such that every, the, the notes verify that you're, uh, you are the one uh, who are sending it, not anyone else, you know, not anyone pretending that it's me, but because I have the only, the only person who has that private key is me, Therefore, this signature proves that because this is the public address I'm sending from and the signature I'm attaching. Therefore, as I said earlier, to the signature together with the, my public address, together with the content that I, 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 I kind of made the signature with, that verifies the private, the person who sends are, is actually the, the person who holds the private key of this, this uh, public key. So that's what makes it. Um, yeah, so, um, so that's exactly that. And I'm just gonna be, you know, like if you really wanna understand what the internal structures of Bitcoin, uh, it's basically, you know, the, the transactions that are kind of like, these are single transactions using kind of like, it's called Merkel uh, root hash. That means each of them are kind of like, if you have a thousand uh, transactions that you selected from the unordered, you know, the unordered verified one, you take those ones, you make hashes of hashes of trees, and the final hash of the root hash is considered as part of the block. And the rest are like basically the proof of work that was used. That means like the nuance that you added to make this thing a block, um, plus some other, the number of transactions that are included, just very few numbers. And then the hash of, of course, the entire block um, basically also is part of the block. And that is what is referred by the next block, by the next block. So this is the Bitcoin. Um, it's slightly different for uh, Ethereum because Ethereum, on top of you know uh, Bitcoin, is actually much. It's only used for transactions and currencies, while blockchain, like the Ethereum, actually is also used for smart contracts. Therefore, it needs on top of these transactions, it needs to store data, and therefore it has a memory concept. So there is a storage. Um, as you can see in the, the, the left one, so the, the content of a block in Ethereum is also like it has a storage, it has the state of the, you know, the chain and, and, and many others plus exactly what most of what uh, Bitcoin has. So it's just much more of, you know, what, what data that you put in, in the block is what distinguishes that. And the good thing about it is that because the Merkle tree has a very nice property, you don't have to check every single transaction to know something is changed or not, because if someone changes inputs like in one block, which is already mined, for example, something, they change a number, then it will make the entire hierarchy of the tree wrong. So which means like, you know, the block, you can detect that someone is making a fraud, so immediately. Okay, and this is the kind of um, how you define it just the, the block in terms of code, but I'm, and unfortunately. And what the transaction does is actually it induces a state change in, in both, you know, if you think of it in both Bitcoin or um, Ethereum, it's like there is a state that is the, the blocks has been, and now when you make one transaction, you actually change the state. And in the bottom uh, plot, you see the state, the very first state, now you make, you have one transaction, you apply it, you change the state like that. So if you if you are kind of person who likes to understand with using state machines, this is what you know blockchains you can think of them as change of states based on every transaction. And this is the same whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum or any other uh, blockchain. Okay. And the the way that money or value is defined is different also from uh, Bitcoin and, and Ethereum. And in Bitcoin, it's actually the output of the previous chain is used like, you know, as it's called um, unspent transaction. So that means you're actually money, you don't have none of the accounts 
have associated account to them. Like that means that, you know, you have this thing. It's all about you have to sum together. The unspent amount is what is considered your value, right? While in, in actually Ethereum, you have a, a, a space for the, actually the account that you have. So how much Ethereum you have is already inside part of the block. So that's the, the two differences. And then Ethereum, for example, or some networks, some blockchains use proof of stake. Some uh, uh, like, for example, Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, so far as well, they use proof of work. Proof of work is what exactly I demonstrated. You just have to search computationally the hash to have a certain property. And there is no way, it's the cryptography mathematics, it proves that there is no way that you can do it without applying some computational power. While in proof of stake, what you have is that you, if you have a stake, you, you kind of stake your tokens, like the, the, your value, and then you participate in consensus making. And if you make any mistake, your, the tokens that you actually deposited will be taken. And on top of that, because if you have a lot of stake, and if the value of the, the points dropped, you will be the loser. So for many reasons, the proof of stake, the, the, you know, is kind of like really one of the things that's coming because it's parallelizable and it's, it just doesn't take that much computational power. From environment perspective, proof of stake, you don't need to do any harsh finding, you know? So that's kind of like what Ethereum is doing. And, you know, there's, you should read about, you know, there is also, of course, uh, the cons for, for the proof of stake because, you know, 51% people who own 51% could make, um, you know, because it's stake-based, that means, it's, you know, you can think of it as stakeholders voting, basically. So that's the proof of stake concept. So I'm not gonna go in detail, but what is really, as I said, my, my beginning is that to really highlight just the details of what is in a block, you know, what is, which data there is, what code do you do, right? So the really, the whether you write Python or JavaScript or, you know, uh, so, um, uh, some other uh, Solidity or some any other um, code, you know, all you have to deal most of the time is, of course, creating codes. If it is for Ethereum, for smart contracts, you have to write codes in Python that would actually specify which hash, you know, which, you know, like in this case, for example, the code lives inside the memory and the memory costs because now everybody is owning your thing. So it's really, really expensive. So that means that you want to minimize the amount of data that you say, well, at the same time, kind of your code becoming something useful, right? And then your code, just like Ethereum has two uh, accounts. One is like the exact uh, account that we described, your private key. But then you can also have like another account, which is called the robot account. That basically means like they, they are just codes. You know, they only act, they don't instantiate any transaction by themselves, but you can send transactions to them, some kind of message, and they act on, 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 on that data. And that is what is really called a smart contract. It's just a piece of code that is run by a virtual machine inside uh, the Ethereum blockchain. I'm just rushing, as you might see this, because of time. Um, and so you, you know, and where is, like, I think the most uh, question that I had was, where is data stored, for example, in a blockchain? You have to know it is really saved in each of, like, if, if it's a full node, so there are these two concepts of full and light node, but a full node stores an entire thing. If it is, you know, a terabyte, it, it, it just takes, it, it is growing, right? So in some way, like a full chain will really take the entire, you know, a full uh, node would basically have everything. All the transactions, the codes, you know, whatever it is, uh, in the, the entire blockchain. And they are able to really verify everything. Light codes, light nodes are actually, they store only a certain, as I said earlier, you know, the entire transaction, you don't need to store it to verify. You can actually just have a selected version of it. You still always can prove that, you know, whenever something is wrong, you can actually verify because of the structure of the Mercury tree. And so now if you want to write codes and understand what the data is, the data is like transactions actually are stored as Merkle trees, um, just hashed on top of them, you know, as a tree. And then the block is basically like the top hash included and some other um, useful kind of like informations together with it. So if you want to really understand 
who owns what, whatever, some kind of data insight you want to explore. That's like kind of like, I'm, I'm going to skip this one, like Ethereum, but that's kind of like, you can go, there are some uh, block explorers. You can exactly understand, you know, each piece of it, you know, like uh, you can actually uh, make, mine the data uh, as much as you want. You can get like, you know, the top 10 um, owners of, you know, uh, Bitcoin. You know, you, you go to just to a full node, there are services that you can actually get the data. And then basically you can just go and get the data and sort it, you know, the way that you do exactly just any uh, data science. And you can actually provide information like this, for example, through um, um, a dashboard, or you can actually use it, for example, if you want to trade, if you are working on uh, crypto trading, uh, whatever, you can actually select like who is sending what as your feature, right? So for example, you can go into the Bitcoin um, uh, notes, like uh, just you download everything and you can actually say like, okay, like who first you identify which user or which, uh, which public key or which address has the most Bitcoin, right? And now what are they transactions? Are they kind of, you know, transactioning? It could be to themselves, you don't know, but at least are they making a lot of transaction now? And if so, can I infer from that as a way of like, you know, should I bid more or should I bid higher, right? So kind of you can take that one as, as actually features as well. And the same is for, uh, for Ethereum. So the whole point, I think, you know, just I'm, I run out of time, but the whole point of this is just to try to really show you where the data is and how the data is structured and put in blockchain and what smart contracts are in, in Ethereum and, and, and blockchains that support smart contracts. Uh, Bitcoin doesn't, the Bitcoin um, blockchain doesn't, but Ethereum, you know, Pol Polana, Polana is actually part of it, uh, the Ethereum, but there are Solana and many others that are actually, um, you know, Cardano, all of this that allows you some kind of uh, contract writing, which is basically a piece of code that means Anyone who, who knows how to code and just learns the syntax of it, you know, even in Python, you can write it and it can compile in Ethereum. So there's no kind of syntax that you learn. It's only just the way of writing because some, some features are restricted for many reasons. But you now know the data, you know what is kind of like what kind of code or what kind of variables you will refer to because of by knowing the structure of the, the chain or the block. So I think I would stop that uh, to leave just for, and if you want without needing anything, if you want to actually code, you can go to remix.ethereum.org that you can actually have live, uh, you know, kind of live ED uh, to coding, you know, to kind of practicing your code. So let me stop that. And then I will just uh, question and answers. Sorry for actually uh, running out of time. I think I, I underestimated. And also I, I, at the beginning that I lost some time, so, okay. No problem, next time we just have to hash uh, the next, next part, the part two of this talk onto this talk. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions, guys? I hope everyone understood 100% of what Yevavel said and can now implement their own DAO. So, so there is a question from Sinmay. If someone wants to use more than one blockchain solution, uh, how can it work together? I think, so th this is, you know, in, in some way, if I understand the question, beyond just uh, the simple question here, when we want Web3, what we really want is, we don't want to be aggregated in, in one chain, into, an, into a, one blockchain, and then our coin is existing in another blockchain, uh, stuff like that. And that is really, really the central question some, some other uh, exchangers are trying to solve, right? You know, so the, actually what you are really asking, if I understand is that is really Web3 will not happen with all these blockchains living separately. They must come into one and they must, you must exchange money like, or value or contract uh, within that. Right, so there are there are solutions and technologies, but it's really a great thing to think about, and it's not a solved one yet. So it's a, and the, the, the nice thing about to talk about blockchain is that so many things are still out there to be solved, and and 
you know, you have to know the value of the entire kind of cryptocurrency and DeFi and all that is kind of in now in three, three, more than three trillion. So that means really, and it's growing, especially the Web3 one. Of course, there are debates, but it's still kind of, you know, the most sensational thing that we have at the moment. So working and thinking like that is really useful. Okay. And Yeah, interoperability, exactly. So that's what Patrick is talking about. This is really, really um, kind of the hot topic. And there are some uh, kind of uh, technologies that are coming, uh, trying to address, but still it's not a solved one. If I may I mean, ask. Yeah, go on and say. Yeah, so uh, I've been listening to you carefully. So. What you basically said is Web3 isn't censored at all, right? There's no censorship in Web3. Um, no, there will be if, the, if it's so, but it's basically you can, you know, if someone blocks you, you can take that, your own block, and start somewhere else. In a way, it, it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't say about what governments could do. It only says, like, once you live in that chain, you are free I mean, it was, it's permissionless you you get in and no one can really say like okay stop here you know when we say it's the same as like the same uh, when you have uh, like internet providers many internet providers in a country the government cannot shut the internet the reason is because then they have to shut every every single of them and usually that is not possible if you have one telecommunication or like you know a few providers then the government is allowed to to block them because it's only few they block them all right so it's the same but when you have like now multiple people having owning the same thing allowing other people to join you cannot just block them does that does that provide uh... yes but you know the problem will extend to be more political because all these mainstream media giants uh, whether you call it Twitter, Facebook, or, or Google, whatever that is, they're kind of, you know, their censorship has deeply some political meanings. And what this, what the introduction of Web3 means, uh, it's basically a threat to them. So how do we see a future in cryptocurrencies and blockchain technologies going further in the next decade or so? The problem will be, I'm afraid, <laughs> political. Yeah, I, I think I think of course the debate is not gonna stop and I'm not gonna speculate or get in there. Absolutely, not only that, you know, some governments would just you know, Russia is planning to ban everything, you know, China did, you know, India is thinking, you know, it's kind of banning entire uh, cryptocurrency stuff like that, it can happen. And you know, governments don't wanna lose control. Um and also some might think like okay this would lead to but overall just like the internet you know if more people joins you know no governments nor anybody can stop it right because the internet can't stop it uh, per se so sure there will be some you know drawbacks and absolutely it's not it's not a promise to heaven it's just that a new technology that allows a certain degree of freedom Okay, so there is the personalized self-contained environment, just as Joker is your own. Um, yeah, and some I think in some way it's really it's this. Everybody has a copy, so no one can cheat when you have your, your own. You know, your copy and you can cheat. That's the the point. If that all the data is stored in Facebook, you know, you, you can't say anything. Facebook has an ultimate say. Um, the, not nobody. I mean, brand. It's like if you lose the private key, you're nobody. That's it. Just simple as your private key is your your coin. You can call it. If I, if you if you have in that in that private key a million dollar, that's just that's it. You can you can really roughly say the private key is a million dollar. So it's just that. Not if you don't have it, you don't. If you don't have the private key, you don't have the million dollar. Simple as that. Whoever has that private key, you know, it, it has nothing because you don't register your name, where you come from, and all that. You have only private key. And that's a real advantage, right? You can be anybody. You can be a robot if you want, you can be a bird, 
if you are smart. Like, so in a way, it doesn't matter. If you have a private key, you have a private key. I mean, so it's exactly, like, why would they? Hello, yeah? Yeah, where do I save it, my private key, safely, like? I didn't, I didn't catch that one. Where do I save my private key, like, safely? Ah, you can give it to me, Barricade, I'll take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the point, like, uh, like hacking, uh, like breaking uh, yeah. blockchain private key will be difficult, but breaking into yeah. someone's computer and taking some data is becoming I mean, somewhat easy. But, uh, like, how how do I store it? Safely? Like, with yeah, I mean, I, I think I, you know, like if you ask me, it's usually the recommend are these cold wallets. That means like they're offline. You know, like you, you know, this Ledger Nano or Ledger Ace, blah blah. So they they are basically just like they are never online, um, and whenever you wanna digitally sign, you, they basically connect through. Um, you know, you you connect them through um, uh, some USB cable, and then you just sign, and then you just take it off, right? So you minimize that, and it's always like it's like if you are making it offline, someone can steal it. If someone comes and steals from steals it from your house, that's it. So in a way, it's not you know like anything else. You can you know protect it for a while, and definitely you know it's not it's much more secure if you make it cold. But even if you make it in a more in a very private way, like you know, I don't think it's like you. If someone really targets you, it's probably harder. Right? It's really just targeting you, knowing that you have m amount of you know a million cryptocurrency and if they really want to steal it you're going to be in a much troubled position than uh if you if you are if it's not known but I mean, the good thing about bitcoin is that no one knows who who the owner of that address is because there's no face there's no address there's nothing so in that way you can think of it yeah like that but uh, it, i think it's much more of like securing your house you know? It's um, yeah, thank, thank you. Okay, exactly. Yeah, hot wallet, cold wallets are much better, which means basically, you know, some kind of USB thing that, that can connect and that stores your private key um, so that you can put it in your neck, just or like your mobile. That's that's it, it's not connected at all with internet. That's the advantage of okay. So I think those are the questions if I... If can I, I, can I ask one question, Yeah, Yeah. So I think there seems to be a little bit of confusion or that people think of Web3 and they think of Bitcoin or Ethereum as yeah. currency. What are some of the other use cases? Um, because money is fine, right? But there's I think there's, yeah. a, there's a project in Ethiopia that I'd read about in terms of identity management. People are talking about land registration. Bitcoin is, it sounds good because it's making a lot of money, but surely that's... That's not the only "quote unquote" killer app. Sure, sure. No, it's uh, it's absolutely not right. So, you know, there are companies already, insurance companies that are just purely built out of, you know, the the entire. So it's called headless uh, companies. That means there is no administration. The administrators are smart codes that write, that can buy online, that can pay people uh, online because they, you know you write codes. They act basically like if you submit a certain piece of evidence that you delivered something, you know, on the agreed component, the code understands it. They release money funding to you and they buy online a certain stock. So, you know, you don't have any of them. So that is kind of like farms, like managed by it's called decentralized uh, organizations. Right. So it's basically they are decentralized autonomous organizations called DAO. The entire concept of DAO is basically that. But now even in the metaverse like this, you can buy properties inside a virtual space. You know, people spend so much money, so much time building a space. Like, you know, I think the recently it was sold for a certain million, 17 million, a digital space that someone cultivated and, 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 and kind of created. And in that, when you really think of it that way, it, make, it be, actually it's endless. It's basically whatever we do here, it can be done. But on top of that, even like 
I think you can think of it also just contents like digital arts, whatever these uh, elements that you can actually securely um, verify and sell. Right? You know, that's another version of blockchain. It's just they all leave, you know, it is known uh, that the kind of like this uh, NFT, you know, that's another technology. So I would say they, even for me, like one of the things that I'm very interested in is that how can you, because in, in the in developed worlds so or in, in the developing countries, the hardest part is that people, most of the things that they have is like physical, right? Now, all you have in the blockchain is a code that once written, it will execute based on a certain message, right? If it controls a physical reality, actually it can also act like like you know like you can think of it as a uh, insurer like uh, you know um like it's not only insurance it's a uh, where you you become actually an authority to if two people make an agreement that i will give you this much and then uh, the other person named some car and that finance basically that that way of like and if they put collateral to it if and then if they agree how they will send the message you know which message um they were saying such that when the other person pays, you know, the contract expires, you know, all this can be because it is it's digital. So you have to think a lot more harder, but it actually can happen. It can control even the external world. And if it can control the external world, it acts like either if you think of it as an organization or think of it as government. Right. So people are trying to replace with this thing of anything that manages you know, any, anything that you require, manage in third party authentication or authorization, you can replace it. And I think the entire, our reality is made up of that, right? Based on, you know, some states or some organizations affirming, attesting uh, what we have, what we don't have, you know, our credit, our bank doing, uh, kind of saying that we have this much money and our, somebody saying like, this house is ours, like that, you know, like all of this, now, in principle, you can manage it. It's just you need to innovate, and that's what people are doing at the moment, innovating around it. How you put everything into this into this chain? Because once you have it there, it's just you know it's the most secure thing you have. So I, I don't know if I address your question, Arun, but it is really what ex what excites people. Web three in the blockchain, even beyond just finance, is. DAOs, like you know, decentralized autonomous organizations, and, and many more, like for basically credit management. Like if you produce a work of art or you know, something, you know, you can earn from it. And um, you know, so it's kind of like the economics of it, the administration and management of it. So anything that anything that you can, yeah, you 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 want to be able to control based on sending a message, this one can do. Okay, thank you. I think there's two more questions. I don't know if you want to yeah. take them, you have the belt and we can close. Yeah, from your comment for papers just starting. Ah, yeah, so uh, in the slide, I, I think we definitely could sh should share, like I would say, Arun, uh, the PDF, but at least I will share in the Almunai page uh, the, the references, just the text because that's helpful. Yeah, some of the, I mean, most of the, like the references that I quoted are really just a few, but they are deep and they can give you from basic to uh, uh, very deep, you know, kind of uh, detailed, especially for example, the Ethereum white and yellow papers are, are key. Just they, they really detail everything, the, the way of thinking. So it may take some time, but they are easy to understand and they go as mathematical as you want or highlight as you want. If you want the highlight, you read the white paper. If you want more detail, the mathematical proofs, whatever, you can go the yellow. Um, so I will share with that one. So I think NFTs and the metaverse, in terms of like, I think if you understand now the blockchain, it is basically like the, you have an address I mean, I, I'm um, so the way I'm, I'm kind of describing much more of my, my way of understanding more than what actually it is. So, um, but for me, the way I understand uh, the metaverse is that basically 
it is a way of people's need. Now we have this capacity, right? Digitally, people are, you know, the social media. If, if someone has been thinking about social media in 2005, 2006, 2007, you might not understand why it is a big deal, right? But then now, it is much easier to understand from our perspective, we get our information there. We get every update there. Everybody is connected there, you know, billions and uh, two, three billions, I don't know now the number, maybe four billions are connected there. It's borderless. You reach people, it's a communic. it's a, you know, it's not only just, uh, you meet people that you never thought you'd meet in a physical reality. So the entire construct of a social thing that we thought before social media has changed, right? How we consume information, even how our bookmarks work, you know, where we used to get single information from one source. Now, by just adding friends, you know, by just following people in, in Twitter, we expand, right? It's just in basically impossible before to think about that, to get access from the top people, you know, some reference, how they think and what they think. Because everybody got it, and therefore the social media became, for some actually, the real media, you know, the, the real social, like just the, it, most some people even left the actual space, like, you know, the physical, the, the actual social one. Instead, it's kind of like the media one is winning for most. And the value it's generating from economics perspective is huge. You know, think of, you know, the, the money, Facebook's value, like just build, and also like now, um, uh, Instagrams and all that. So it's like, if you think of it from that perspective, metaverse is like another way of thinking. Right now, it may seem some geeks, blah, blah, and some people just getting in there. But as soon as, if you imagine, billions and billions of people are gonna kind of, the same as they scroll Facebook and Twitter, now they're gonna be walking around and, and seeing things and putting headphones and kind of like these VRs, then you can think of like the money is generated from the, if you want to think of it from money perspective, if you want to think of it from the possibilities perspective, because somebody is building now for you their culture and you go and interact with that. So not only you read about their culture, but now you will start feeling it, right? So, and then every of that is actually then now you will be credited for. So that means you will get, you know, you will put this, NFTs and and you basically earn from them because you that's basically saying um, patent. It's much more of a patent uh, system and that patent uh, a very live patent system that you earn from it, right? And with some with some contracts associated to that, basically, will whoever uses that thing the met, in the metaverse will know you know it's you and the commission whatever you will get some certain commission. So I would say. If you think of it from now to then perspective, it's much harder to see. But if you think of it like the social media from what you, we know now, social media and what could have been early, it's much easier. I don't know if I address Milky uh, your question, but that's how I, I like to see it because that's how things start and, um, and just the possibilities are, it's not yet made. You know, the you know, metaverse is still in the development and what would come out from it is just endless. Or it could just be, of course, a, a hype. But I would say, if it if it evolves like the social media and a lot of people joins and people start interacting there and more value is generated there, you know, more innovations are coming out of there. Science is being done because you know whatever meetings are happening like that, you know, you can just uh, blah blah. You know, you can think of the economic terms as well as the the, the actual you know change in reality in how we live. Yeah. Can I add something there? Great. I think, yeah. I think, so I, th I think there's the technical aspect, there's the employment aspect, and then there's sort of the where is this, is it all a big scam? And I'm sure I agree with you, there's a lot of scams there. But I think for us as an organization, we're really interested in keeping um, everyone we train at the, maybe not at the cutting edge, but at the leading edge of technology. And this is a area of work that's in great demand. And so I think in terms of the career, opportunity uh, spectrum this is one thing that we want to prepare people for and so you'll i think when it comes to a job there'll be many different types of companies doing different things so i think this is one of the reasons why we're interested in that but 
I think there's a lot of uh, noise and fluff. Just in the city where I live, there's a huge coin that's trying to advertise some sort of uh, their own currency, NASA Doji coin, which sounds like a big scam to me. And apparently it is. But buyer beware. But I think in terms of jobs and careers, definitely interesting. Awesome. I think this was great. So thank, thank you. Yes. I don't know if someone from the, does somebody want to give a vote of thanks to our speaker? Somebody can just unmute and can do a vote of thanks, and then we'll stop recording. Yeah, this is it's really an interesting topic because it's one of the most cutting edge technologies right now. So knowing about Web3, blockchain and anything really is helpful. So thank you everyone for just, you know, some clearing some clouds from the concept of what we perceived. Thank you. OK, thanks. Thank you, everyone. And we'll be posting the uh, links in the alumni group, and we'll put it on Twitter, on our Twitter account and LinkedIn account as well, so people can uh, access the content. Thank you, everyone. Cheers, everyone. Bye.